I'm Susan Gregory. I'm the director of the Bozeman Public Library. And I'm Sheila Banan. I'm a reference to the construction library at MSU and a member of the Montana Library Association of Intellectual Freedom. She's being shy. Sheila's worked on behalf of intellectual freedom for years. And she's also worked with the ACLU. <laughs>
Unfortunately, these challenges and bannings have a long history. Pretty much ever since the written word was fixed in some way, there have been people who have complained about that. But in fact, you can find all kinds of examples from the Greeks where they were arguing amongst each other about whether something should be available or not. But there's also been those who have fought for the freedom to read. And to illustrate this, um, one of our readers tonight, Jack Lederman, found a great quote from John Milton that was written in 1644. I invite him to come up and share that with us. This is from a speech of Mr. John Milton for the liberty of unlicensed printing to the Parliament of England, November 23, 1644. He was very upset that. Um, after centuries of the Catholic Church requiring an imprimatur, a let this be printed stamp on things uh, to be published, that the Protestant Parliament in England in 1644 passed an order exactly like that. And this was part of his response. First, uh, it is against the recent order by the Protestant Parliament that, quote, no book shall henceforth be printed unless the same be first approved and licensed. And then he said, Milton, the attempt to keep out evil doctrine by licensing is like the, quote, exploit of that gallant man who thought to pound up the crows by shutting his park gate. Uh, and this is the quote. I, I cannot praise a fugitive and cloistered virtue, unexercised and unbreathed, that never sallies out and sees her adversary, but slinks out of the race where that immortal garland is to be run for, not without dust and heat. Assuredly, we bring not innocence into the world, we bring impurity much rather. That which purifies us is trial, and trial is by what is contrary. That virtue, therefore, which is but a youngling in the contemplation of evil, and knows not the utmost that vice promises to her followers and rejects it, is but a blank virtue, not a pure, her whiteness is but an excremental whiteness, which was the reason why our sage and serious poet, Spencer, whom I dare be known to think a better teacher than Scotus or Thomas Aquinas, describing true temperance, temperance under the person of Sir Guion, brings him with his palmer to the cave of Mammon and the bower of earthly bliss that he might see and know and yet abstain. Since therefore the knowledge and survey of vice is in this world so necessary to the constituting of human virtue and the scanning of error to the confirmation of truth, how can we more safely and with less danger scout into the regions of sin and falsity than by reading all manner of tractates and hearing all manner of reason? And this is the benefit which may be had of books promiscuously read. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
But the other um, uh, problem with the focus on sexual content is that it detracts from another important historical aspect of this book, which was a rather shameful period in, in our nation's history. <clears throat> so here's my reading. By centuries turn, over 300 Japanese had arrived on San Pietro, most of them schooner hands who jumped ship in Port Jefferson Harbor in order to remain in the United States. Within a week, the ship jumpers possessed no jobs, stacking lumber, sweeping sawdust, hauling slab wood, boiling machines, for 11 cents an hour. Company books preserved in the Island County Historical Archives record that in 1907, 18 Japanese were injured or maimed at the Port Jefferson Mill. Jap number 107, the books indicate, lost his hands to a ripping blade on March 12 and received an injury payment of $7.80. Jap number 57 dislocated his right hip on May 29 when a stack of lumber toppled over. In 1921, the mill was dismantled. All of the island's trees had been fed to the saws so that San Pietro resembled a bald, stump desert. The mill owners sold their holdings and left the island behind. The Japanese cleared strawberry fields, where strawberries grew well in San Pietro's climate required little starting capital. <coughs> they saved their money in canning jars, <coughs> then rode home to their parents in Japan, requesting wives be sent. Some lied and said they'd gotten rich or sent pictures of themselves as younger men. At any rate, wives came across the ocean. They lived in cedar slat huts, lit by oil lamps, and slept on straw-filled ticks. The wind blew in through the cracks in the walls. At five o'clock in the morning, bride and groom both could be found in the strawberry fields. Thus, life went forward on San Pietro. By Pearl Harbor Day, there were 843 people of Japanese descent living there, including 12 seniors at Amity Harbor High School who did not graduate that spring. Early on the morning of March 29, 1942, 15 transports of the U.S. War Relocation Authority took all of San Diego's Japanese Americans to the ferry terminal in Amity Harbor. They were loaded onto a ship while their white neighbors looked on people who had risen early to stand in the cold and watch this exorcising of the Japanese from their midst. Friends, some of them, but the merely curious mainly, and fishermen who stood on the decks of their boats out in Amity Harbor. Fishermen felt, like most islanders, that this exiling of the Japanese was the right thing to do, <clears throat> and leaned against the cabins of their stern pickers and bow pickers with the conviction the Japanese must go for reasons that made sense. There was a war on, and that changed everything.